Okay, students, Assalamu Alaikum. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Muhammad Umar Siddiqui. And uh, inshallah, I will be the instructor for, uh, I will be your instructor for the course of engineering thermodynamics. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering from uh, NED University. And then after that, I did my master's and PhD from King Fahad University. I had an experience of teaching at uh, Imam Abdul Rahman University, previously known as University of Imam. So currently I have uh, joined uh, Zabist uh, just now, uh, this semester. So this will be my first semester teaching here in Zabist. Uh, are you able to hear me properly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So, um, my my background is basically from mechanical and uh, specifically from thermofluid side. We have three sub branches of mechanical um, mechanics. We have uh, uh, so so I'm basically from thermofluids and uh, uh, even the subcategory is uh, renewable energy sector. But anyways, uh, the course that I'm about to teach you this semester engineering thermodynamics this course uh, i have taught about six to seven times before uh, in the previous university and uh, uh, alhamdulillah i have a good uh, i have a good command over this course and inshallah i will try my best to to deliver you as much as possible the knowledge and make things easy for you uh, regarding this course uh, okay i have uh, I, I got the access to Zabdesk uh, just day before yesterday, and I uploaded uh, uh, most of the course outline there. So probably you can see the course outline. Also, I posted uh, the first lecture, the, PD, the, the PDF of the PowerPoint slides for the first lecture, both in a Google Classroom as well as in uh, Zabdesk. Were you able to access it? Were you able to download it? Yes, sir, we were. Okay, good. Inshallah, I'm going to provide you the textbook, uh, soft copy of the textbook, reference books, all the lecture material, and any other material associated with it. Uh, this course is comparatively a very easy course, but uh, you need to have physical understanding of it. Otherwise, this course becomes quite difficult. So, but inshallah, this will be my responsibility, my job to, to make things easy for you, to, to, to make you understand the course material as much as possible. Uh, my communication with you, uh, medium of communication would be English, as uh, I have been told that it should be English uh, in Zabist. So I'm going to continue with that, but eventually uh, on and off if, if needed, we can switch to Urdu and, between Urdu and English. So, okay. Uh, okay, so let's uh, go through the course outline first so that we discuss about this course. Today, my objective would be first to introduce you with the course, course outline. The most important thing is that you should understand why are we learning the course? I mean, what, what are the main advantages? I mean, what is the importance of studying this course? Okay, and how does it uh, correlate and how does it uh, uh, how, uh, how does it uh, validate its presence within mechatronics engineering, Department of Mechatronic Engineering? So let's go through with the course outline. Probably you were able to access the course outline yourself as well in the Zap desk, or I don't know how. So this is your section B. This course is ME2405 Thermodynamics in your degree plan. I'm Dr. Mohamed Siddiqui. I introduced myself. Okay. Uh, your class timing will be 14 to 16 PST. It's room 409. I was told to write that, but I don't know. You guys are in room 409 or you're, you're, you're in your homes? Yeah, okay. obviously. Yeah, okay, good. Anyways, uh, this course is two credit hours. I taught this course about six or seven times before, but every time when I taught this course, it was three credit hours. So, but anyways, in your degree plan, if it is two credit hours, we are going to do it. Uh, as uh, as per the degree plan requirements. Prerequisite is engineering physics. Uh, so you might already have done that. 
Okay, consultation time. I consultation time. I have placed it on Monday, nine to eleven, PST. Okay, so but uh, it's negotiable in case if you want to to have some discussion with me uh, uh, on 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 any any other day and any other time we can discuss that. Uh, email. This is the email uh, which which have been provided to me by Zabist. Uh, you can see it's written here, contact information. This is my contact number right now. This is also my WhatsApp number. The course description, we can go through it later. The course objectives, we'll come to it later. Okay, let's discuss about this course itself. What this course of thermodynamics is about. Uh, the main objective of- Excuse me, of sir, do, we have a, do you have a presentation open right now? Because we can't see anything. Oh, okay. Thank you. Not the presentation. It was uh, the window. Uh, thank you. I forgot to switch it to that. Okay. So, can you see the? Can uh, can you see the? Thermal yes, sir. It's yes, sir. It's yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for letting me know. I thought I I, I shared it. Okay. Anyway, so we were discussing about uh, the course itself. We're gonna talk about the course description objectives later, okay? Uh, let's first discuss about this course, what this course is all about. Uh, this course is basically the main objective of the course is that uh, uh, we have a lot of energy in this world, okay? But uh, not all of the energy is usable. Uh, the, the more correct analogy, something that you can understand it much better is that uh, we have, uh, like, for example, we have a lot of water in the world, like 70% of the earth is more than 70% is filled with water, water, but not all the water is usable. So there is a possibility that a person is there in the ocean and uh, he can die of thirst because that water is not drinkable, not usable. <coughs> so, uh, in the same way, we have a lot of energy in, in the world, okay? And most of the energy that we have is in the form of heat. But the heat energy is really not usable. Now, we as humans, what we need to do is we need to find a way. We need to design some, some device that can convert heat into some useful output. Right now, we have energy as heat but that is not usable by us. We cannot use it. Can you tell me which is the most useful form of energy? Can anybody tell me which is the most useful form of energy? It's okay, uh, guess anybody. Carbon energy? Uh, okay, carbon energy, anybody else? Sir, kinetic could energy. Repeat your Hmm? Kinetic. Okay, you studied physics, that's why you had kinetic in mind. Any anything? Anybody else? So light energy. Light energy. Light, light energy. Okay. Anybody else? The most the most useful form of energy is electrical energy. If you have electricity, you can produce all those other forms of energy. You can produce light if you have electricity. You can generate power. You can, uh, you can produce refrigeration. You can, you can use it in any form. You can produce sound if you have uh, electrical energy. Electrical energy is the main energy which is being utilized in, uh, within the societies for all their purposes. We have devices that run on electricity. Okay. So the most useful form of energy is electrical energy. Now, uh, the irony of the fate is here that uh, unfortunately, this most useful form of energy is not available naturally. You might find places where you go and you can find fresh water there, but you will not find a single place where you go and you can find electricity available there. Electricity is is the most useful form of energy, but it's not nat naturally available. So what do we need to do? The main objective of this course is that we have a lot of useless form of energy, which is heat, and we want to convert it into useful form. And the most useful form is the electrical energy. There are other forms of energy as well. For example, uh, you have energy and you want to convert it into mechanical power so that you can, uh, you can run a device that will transport you from one place to another. 
So, so automobiles, automobiles are basically what? They are thermodynamic devices. They, trans they transport a person from one place to another. And we are using the heat energy in this case. Now, how, the, how are we using the heat energy? The heat energy which is stored in the fuel as potential. So we, we, we generate that, we extract that potential from the fuel, we produce the heat, and then that heat is being used uh, to produce the mechanical power output using the automobile engine, and then the automobile is going to transport you from one place to another. So here, when you are sitting in an automobile and you are using, uh, you, you're using your, uh, the, the, this, this device to convert heat energy into mechanical output, your objective is not to produce electricity. Your objective is to make you transport from one place to another. But this is a useful output. So you are using heat energy for a useful output, whether it is generating electricity or transportation, or whether, whether for example, if you don't have electricity, you cannot even run the air conditioners, the refrigerators. Refrigerator is basically what? It is, a, a, it is a thermodynamic device. It is a thermodynamic device which converts heat energy to, or, or, or which, which is not converting heat energy, rather which is making uh, the cool, making the cooling effect, okay? So this is basically a device which is producing the cooling effect. Otherwise, that cooling effect will not be produced. If you don't have electricity, you won't be able to run an AC, okay? So uh, AC itself is, is, is a thermodynamic device and we are producing a useful output. That cooling produce is a useful output, okay? Uh, similarly, for example, sometimes you're, uh, let's say you are, you are in a cold area in the winter season, there is snow going on. So, so the living conditions are not really comfortable. So sometimes it's not just cooling, sometimes you need to produce heating. And the heating, the device which is producing heating is again a thermodynamic device. Okay, so it's taking the heat from the outside and putting it inside so that the inside atmosphere temperature inside the building becomes comfortable for living, okay? So this is a useful output. So main objective is that, main objective of this course, the first thing is that you need to understand why are we learning this course? What is the objective of this course? The main objective of this course is that we have a lot of useless form of energy in the form of heat, where, that, where it is available and we cannot use it. Now, now our main objective is that to utilize that energy, to, def to, to, to design a device that can utilize that energy into useful output. The useful output could be power generation, electricity production, could be in the form of transportation, could be, could be in the form of cooling effect development, could be in the form of heating generation, or whatever the other. There, there are multiple uh, applications of, of, of these, uh, uh, these devices. So the thing is that this is the main objective right now, first of all. Do you understand the main objective of the course of thermodynamics or not? Now, uh, when, when I will be teaching this course, I would kindly request you, whenever I ask you a question, you respond to me, okay? Because uh, it should not look like that I'm talking to myself only, okay? So it should, uh, it should be a one-on-one -on -one conversation, okay? So uh, first of all, main objective was right now my, was to, to explain you what is the importance of this course. Why are we learning this course? Do you understand this or not? Yes, sir. Okay. We will learn yes, like sir. how to transform useless energy into useful energy. Yes, useless form of the energy, which is there. Like, like for example, like water available in the ocean, is there filled of water, tons of water, but useless. You cannot use it directly. You have, you, you need to def define the uh, you need to design a device which can process that water, and then that water will become usable. That's another thing. In the same way, we have a lot of energy available around us, but all of that energy, is, most of it in the, is in the form of heat and it's useless, you cannot use it. So we need to convert this useless form of energy into, uh, into useful output. The output could be in, in any form, but a useful output, okay? This is the main goal of this course, okay? Now, once we, once we, had, once we establish this thing, now let's come over to the next thing, I mean, how can we design such a device? How can we design such a device? So the main thing is that when we have to design such a device, so we need an energy carrier, something that carry energy, okay? And that thing will carry, obviously initially it will carry the heat energy and then we'll go through different components of the device and then transform uh, that heat energy into useful output. 
okay like for example for example let me give you an example of automobile engine okay you put fuel but the main energy carrier is the air air is the one which combines with the fuel which ignites it takes out the potential energy in the fuel gets heated up then carry the energy with it through the engine runs the engine and then exhaust out so the main carrier of energy in case of our automobiles is air okay so the thing is that we need to understand the behavior of these energy carriers this comes this, this this is the connection you need to you need to design a device that can convert useful useless form of energy into some 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 useful output so if we want to convert useless form of energy into useful output but when we have to design such a device then we need an energy carrier something which will carry the energy from part from component to component and then uh, will be able to deliver the useful output okay so we need to study the energy carriers as well and i gave you the example in case of your automobiles in case of cars motorbikes the energy carrier itself is the air air is the thing that combines with the fuel which ignites takes the potential of the fuel becomes heated and then flow through the engine and uh, run through the engine and convert uh, a useless form of energy which was heat into useful form of energy which is the transportation okay uh, similarly we have other energy carriers as well suppose for example in case of power power plants in boilers we have basically water water is an energy carrier okay so we we are going to study the the behavior the properties basically thermodynamic properties are important means the properties which involve th the thermal interaction okay so we want to deal with the properties that involve thermal interactions or or heat interactions okay so we will study the energy carriers like air we are going to study the properties for water water is another very important energy carrier then we are also going to study another energy carrier which is a refrigerant for example if anybody has uh, gone to let's say uh, let's say a technician ac technician you will find that they have they have a specific cylinder for the refrigerant they fill the they have fill your ac with the refrigerant or okay they see that there is no leakage in the pipes and then they run the system okay so so refrigerant is another energy carrier the thing which is producing the cooling output from the refrigerator is the energy carrier okay and that energy carrier is the refrigerant so we have three energy carriers here we have air we have uh, uh, water and we have refrigerant and we are going to study the properties or uh, thermophysical properties of all these energy carriers in detail okay so that's the connection okay so first you study different different diff different systems then you have to study uh, the energy carriers as well okay so let's uh, discuss a little about uh, the structure the structure of this course we are going to start with the chapter number 1 and chapter number 1 will be introduction to thermodynamics just the basic concepts and definitions okay and uh, then we are going to uh, move towards uh, energy transfer general energy analysis okay then we'll come over to the first law of thermodynamics first law of thermodynamics uh, deals with uh, uh, with the energy conversion okay uh, how how can the energy be converted into from one form of energy to the other form of energy you studied it before in physics in in a specific uh, sense for example you know that kinetic energy and potential energy are interconvertible right so uh, you have uh, you are raising the elevation of something so potential energy is getting stored in that thing now if you release it then the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy as as the object falls on the ground okay so that's the energy conversion from one form of the energy to the other form of energy but we are going to go into much more details into it it's not just that okay so first law of thermodynamics deals with the energy conversion how can the energy be converted from the one form to the other form and this is our objective we have energy in the form of heat which is a useless form of energy and we want to convert into some useful output so we want to change the form of energy are you getting the connection okay so we had energy in the form of heat and we want to convert it into some useful output so we want to convert it we want to change the form of energy so this is first law of thermodynamics we are going to deal with it 
Uh, okay, we're going we're going to first study it in chapter number two. Then after that, uh, we're going to move towards chapter number three. In chapter number three is not the first law of thermodynamics. Rather, we are going to study the energy carriers itself. We're going to study the thermophysical properties for water, for refrigerant, for air. So this is in chapter number three. This is what we are going to do. In chapter number four and five, basically, we will have uh, the application of first law of thermodynamics. One first time we'll have an application for first law of thermodynamics on closed systems. Then we're going to have in, in chapter number five on open systems. We're going to go into detail of it later on. I'm just trying to explain you the structure, how how this thermodynamic course is structured and uh, how, it, how, how within the structure everything is connected to the other. So with chapter number four and five, we are done with the first law of thermodynamics, the energy conversion from one form to another form. But then we are going to start in chapter number six with the second law of thermodynamics. And second law of thermodynamics deals with the limitation of this energy transfer. We can transfer energy from one form to another, but there are some limitations to it. In the world, nothing is ideal. Nothing is perfect. There are limitations. There are advantages. There are disadvantages. Okay, So we are going to discuss about those limitations. The study for the limitations of energy transfer from one form to another form. This is the second law of thermodynamics. It's more like a qualitative analysis. Like the first law of thermodynamics was a quantitative analysis. And second law of thermodynamics, we're going to study the qualitative analysis. Okay, So we're going to introduce a concept of entropy. We're going to discuss about entropy rate balance. We're going to, when, when we're talking about the qualitative analysis, so obviously there comes the concept of efficiency. So nothing is 100% efficient. There are limitations. There are some disadvantages. There are some pros and cons. So we're going to discuss about the pros and cons of these systems. Okay. So we will study the efficiencies, isentropic efficiencies of, of, of devices. With this, our first law and second law analysis is complete. Okay. So first law of thermodynamics and second law of thermodynamics we have studied. Once we have studied first law and second law of thermodynamics, now come the time to apply these laws in order to uh, in, in order to design a system. Okay. So chapter number nine, we are going to design a power cycle. Power cycle are basically what we generate electricity. So we have big power stations and we have power cycles. We have gas power cycles. Okay, so gas power cycles are the ones where the energy carrier was will be air. In case of gas power cycles, our energy carrier will be air, but uh, the main objective will be to generate electricity. Okay, so this is what we are going to study in chapter number nine. That will be the application of first and second law of thermodynamics. Then in chapter number 10, we are going to study again power cycles, but in this time, the energy carrier will not be air. We will have water as our energy carrier. So we will call it vapor power cycles. The main objective there again is to generate electricity, but not using air, using water. Then after that, in chapter number 11, we are going to study the refrigeration cycles. The energy carrier will be the refrigerants. And uh, our main objective would be to produce the cooling effect or to produce the heated space. And with this, our, uh, our study for the thermodynamics course will be over. So the main objective right now here was to explain you the structure of thermodynamics course. Okay, so we start with the introduction, basics, basic thermodynamic properties. You're going to study the, uh, the, the different energy carriers. Then we're going to come over to the first law of thermodynamics where we study that how energy can be converted from one form to the other form. We're going to apply it on a closed system. We're going to apply it on open systems. Then after that, we move to, towards the second law of thermodynamics where we are going to study the qualitative analysis means uh, what are the limitations of this energy transfer? I mean, uh, what are the what are the effective efficiencies here? So we're going to study that. And then after that, we're going to apply it in order to produce power using using air as the medium or producing power using uh, using water as the medium or producing the refrigeration and air conditioning. So this, I summarize the whole course of thermodynamics in front of you right now here uh, from chapter number one till chapter number 11, everything that we are going to study in this course, inshallah. So before moving forward, now I need your feedback. I need your response. Let me know. Do you so, understand? Yeah. So are we losing any chapters because of it being a two credit hour course? <laughs> Actually, the course content that, that was provided to me, you look here, uh, I have to follow the course content which is provided to me. 
Now, you see here the topics, background introduction, energy work transfer, closed systems, open system, control volumes, entropy, and second law, power generation, refrigerator, ideal, ideal gas vapor mixtures. Even we, I'm not covering some, some of the areas here. Like, for example, I'm not covering, covering the, uh, the psychometrics. I'm not, con, con, I'm, I'm not covering relative humidity and humidity ratio. I'm not covering uh, the thermochemistry and uh, uh, electrical, electromechanical applications. I'm not covering exergy. So even after leaving all these things, still we have to cover all, all, the, all the chapters as I have shown you. Uh, this is unfortunate because this is what I have been given. So I have to follow in this way. But anyways, within each chapter, we do not need to, fo we do not need to cover everything, okay? So you need to focus over my slides and uh, uh, we, will, we, we will leave some of the portion and we will cover some of the portion. But uh, anyways, still, whatever the demand of the course, as set by the uh, mechatronics department, I, this is my responsibility to, to ful ful fulfill it. And at the same time, this is also my responsibility to make you understand the subject as good as possible. So inshallah, things will be okay. But yes, the, the materials which I have discussed you, I have to cover all those materials. And so I think, pro yes. Please continue. Please continue. Yeah, so, and, I, and I think, because I'm going to teach this course uh, here in Zabis for the first time, but I think this material used to be covered even before before me as well. So it, because I got uh, the uh, 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 an old file from uh, from one of the faculty member, and it has all these topics. So probably we previous students used to cover that, and we are also going to cover it, inshallah. Yes. So my question was uh, that uh, in a three credit hour course, would there be additional chapters that you yes, would Yes, 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 there will be additional chapters. In three credit hour course, we will cover chapter number eight, which we are missing here, and we'll cover chapter number 14 and 15, which we are missing here. Okay, okay. Okay. Sir, your all slides will be uploaded on GCR. Uh, go, Google Classroom. Right now, yes. I have, I, right now, I have, uh, I, I have uploaded only chapter number one slide on Google Classroom as well as on uh, Zapdesk. But unfortunately, because I got the access just uh, day before yes, just 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 day before today, sorry, just day before yesterday, so I didn't have the time to upload all the material. But uh, inshallah, within a week you will have all the material, all the slides. Also, I will provide you uh, uh, some. Also, I will provide you the textbook, soft copy of the textbook. Also, I am going to provide you some additional material. Okay, so the material will, inshallah, be all provided to you. I will provide you on GCR as well as there as well. Uh, but there, I, I saw a limitation there. For example, on Zapdesk, there was a limitation that a file cannot be more than 20 MB. So if I look at uh, my textbooks, soft copy of, of the textbooks there, I think more than 20 MB. So maybe I don't know. I won't be able to to upload the textbook on Zapdesk, but obviously in the Google Classroom it will be there. Yes, yeah, so Google Classroom is better. You can upload it there. Yeah, I, even even when I had to upload this uh, this the slides for this first lecture, Google Classroom it took me about two minutes, and uh, Zapdesk it took me a lot of time actually to upload that. So every, everything will be there in the Google Classroom as well. Okay, but but anyways, as uh, as part of the university regulation, I also have to upload the material over the Zapdesk as well. So both uh, in both the places, all the material will be there. Okay, sir. Okay. Now my point is that uh, because because I take one subject at a time. Okay. So 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 right now I was explaining you the structure of thermodynamic course as you see through. Uh, throughout in the book. Do you understand it or not? Yes, sir, we do. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, and if, students, uh, please make sure, uh, please uh, understand this thing. I know you are all students, okay? And students have some fears. The first fear a student have is that if I ask a question from the doctor, maybe my question is a stupid question and the doctor will mock me and everybody will laugh. Okay, so don't worry about that. Okay, I'm not guaranteeing that nobody else will laugh, but I'm guaranteeing that I'm not going to mock you. Okay, you are a student, so you are allowed to ask stupid questions. Once you become graduate, then stupidity will not be allowed. 
But for right now, don't worry about that, okay? If you feel that you're not able to understand any of the concept, okay, just let me know that you're, you, you're stuck here and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna explain you again, okay? So this is one thing. The second thing is that uh, uh, my medium of instruction will be English, but uh, are you able to comprehend it? Is there any English barrier that you, you're not able to understand my language? Kindly let me know. Is it clear? My, my communication with you, is it clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anybody has any problem? Okay, good. Okay, the next thing is that uh, uh, communication would be through, uh, through, I think you're taking online classes for, for all, uh, all the courses, so probably it will not be a problem. Okay. Uh, I'm normally I'm going to take attendance after 15 minutes. Okay, normally I'm going to take attendance after 15 minutes. So in case if you if you are willing to to be marked as present, then please uh, uh, be available within 15 minutes of the start of the class. Okay, and uh, in case if you're late, you will mark late. But if you have any genuine reason, then obviously I'm going to consider that. Okay. Uh, as per the university policy, if I'm not wrong, I was told that uh, uh, three absences are allowed in the whole semester. So if you are absent uh, after that, the fourth absent will make you, I don't know, drop the course or whatever, the university policy. So, so please make sure that you attend the classes regularly. Okay. Okay, now let's come over to the grading policy. Okay, so for the grading, <coughs> you will have two assignments in total. Each, each assignment would be 10 marks. Okay, so that will be total 20 marks. Okay, then you will have one final paper, which will be 40 marks. You will have a midterm paper, which will be 20 marks. You will have two quizzes in between each five mark. So that will be 10 marks total for the two quizzes. And uh, I think, uh, and, and I was told that uh, now it's a university policy that every course should have a general viva of 10%. So you will have a general viva 10 marks. Okay, so that makes up total 100% of your course. Okay, anybody want to ask anything? So the viva will be held with the final paper or will you be taking vivas as you go? Uh, no, it will be held with, actually, I, I'm, I'm sorry, because I joined the university just uh, now. This is the first time. So I'm not sure what is, what is the university regulation in that. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, the administration, whatever they want, I'm going to follow that. But for now, I, I, I don't know how to answer this question because I don't know myself what is needed here in this case. Okay. Sir. Okay. okay. So... Uh, the textbook will be Thermodynamics and Engineering Approach by Yunus and Michael. This, this is the eighth edition. Uh, I will provide you eighth edition, uh, but my, my lecture slides are mostly from the fifth edition. Uh, actually, edition to edition, there is not much difference. The concepts remains entirely the same. The only thing that differs is for some, of, for some numericals, the values of the numerical, the numerical, numerical values change a little, okay? So, uh, there's not really much change in it okay so uh, my lecture slides are still made up of uh, from the fifth edition and i will provide you the fifth edition as well as well as the eighth edition will also be provided to you okay the reference book uh, uh, by by moran and Sh shapiro Sh shapiro it will also be provided to you fundamentals of engineering thermodynamics okay uh, come here. okay uh, as per the plan, uh, you will have uh, first week, you will have uh, uh, the chapter number one. We're going to cover chapter number one. Then chapter number two will be covered in the next two weeks. And then you will have your first assignment. And then after that, uh, for two weeks, you will have chapter number three. After that, in chapter, num chapter number four will be covered in the sixth week. And then at that time, you will have your first quiz. Okay. Again, what kind of quiz? How we are going to take it, these all the things I cannot answer you right now. I'm going to discuss with the management and see that uh, how they see things. And then I'm going to follow whatever the university regulations are in this regard. Okay. The university has probably is already set eighth week for the midterm exam. So your midterm exam paper will be in the eighth week. 
then you will have in the 11th week you will have uh, assignment number two then in the 13th week you will have quiz number two I have written here in the 14th week general viva but it's not fixed we're going to see that how this is going to be conducted and what are the demands for it okay so so I'm going to see that uh, whatever whatever the policy I'm going to follow that policy you'll have the final paper after it will not be week 15 it will be after that but anyways this is how the schedule is this is the course plan okay learning outcomes you can go through these learning outcomes i've already mentioned you about this course its importance its structure how it is structured my contact number is provided here email address is also here okay so that's it uh, probably i have uh, covered everything in the course outline with you now, anybody want to ask anything related to course outline, please ask. Okay, I hope everything is clear with you. Yes. Let me just let me let me just take the attendance. Let me take the attendance. We have Abdullah Kazi Kazi is here. Okay, let me. Abdullah Kazi Kazi, your your number is what? Because everybody has a number here, B131, B138. <laughs> Sir, 130. 130. So I think you should you should also write your number against your name. Okay. And then we have uh, Abdullah Zahid, uh, B131. Okay. And then we have B138, 143, 148, 150. 151151152 okay B152 is here B153 B154 B155 B156 B157 B158 B163 B164 B168 there is another A one zero five. A one zero five is here. Is not here. Huh? Okay. A one zero five is not here. And uh, this Anil Ahmed. There is Anil Ahmed. No. Okay. Okay, so I have right now taken the attendance. Uh, now, now we are going to start uh, chapter number one for thermodynamics. Uh, let's have a break of five minutes and then we're going to start. Okay, okay sir. Okay, sir.
Okay, assalamu alaikum students. Uh, let's start with our lecture. Can you hear me? Wa alaikum assalam sir, we can. Uh, can, you, can, can you see, I'm, I'm sharing you the, the lecture slide right now. So can, can you see it on the screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So we're going to first discuss right now thermodynamics. Uh, the contents of this lecture will be thermodynamics and energy. We're going to discuss about that, dimensions and units systems and properties, the state processes and cycles, temperature, pressure, measuring devices, problem solving techniques. Anyways, these are the contents of this first chapter. Inshallah, we're going to cover that. Learn lesson objectives and go through it yourself. Okay, what is thermodynamics? Uh, thermodynamics comes from Greek word. Therm means heat, dynamics means power. The main objective is to uh, use uh, the heat energy and convert it into uh, useful power. Okay, so this is something in the introduction of thermodynamics course I have explained you in detail. The main objective is to convert heat into power. We have a current definition right now for thermodynamics, the study of energy and energy transformations, including power generation, refrigeration, and relationship among the properties of matter. Anyways, I'm not going to ask you the definition, but you can go through it. Applications, uh, we discussed that, uh, in it's, 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 this application is everywhere around us. Air conditioner is a thermodynamic device, heater, refrigerator, humidifier, pressure cooker, water heater, shower, air, iron, uh, computer and TV, automotive, aircraft, rockets, refinery, power plants, nuclear power plants. These, these are all thermodynamic devices, and uh, these are basically the application of thermodynamics. Anyways, uh, let's discuss about dimensions and units. There are basically seven fundamental or primary dimensions. Uh, those fundamental and primary dimensions are length, mass, time, temperature. These four are basically more useful for us. These four are more useful for us. Uh, electric current, amount of light, amount of matter. This is these are not of much of our concern right now. Uh, when we talk about the primary dimensions for the length, the primary dimension is meter. For mass, it's kg. For time, is in seconds. Temperature is Kelvin. Okay. We have uh, standard prefixes. Okay, if we talk about the bigger units, so the bigger units are 10 to the power 12, 10 to the power 9, 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 3, 10 to the power 2, 10 to the power 1. So they are deca, hecto, kilo, mega, giga, tera. Then we have a smaller units. We have 10 to the power minus 1, 10 to the power minus 2, 10 to the power minus 3, minus 6, minus 9, minus 12. So we have deci, centi, milli, micro, nano, pico. So these are some prefixes of our basic uh, for our basic SI units. System and control volume. Uh, since we are going to study thermodynamics, so we have to define a system. Uh, what, do, what do we mean by system? When we say system, we mean anything, any object of our interest. Okay, so anything we are interested to study, that becomes our system, and everything around it becomes the surrounding. Okay, so suppose if we want, if we are interested in studying this system, okay, so this system is our system, because we call it system because this is our area of interest, okay, and then everything around it becomes the surrounding, and obviously between the system and surrounding there has to be a specific boundary, there has to be some boundary which is separating the system from the surrounding, okay, so. Thermodynamic system is a quantity of matter or region in space chosen for study. Surrounding is a mass or region outside the system. So anyways, this is a general concept. So, mm, nothing uh, important here or nothing I can ask you in the exam related to it. Boundary. When we talk about the boundary, so there are, uh, boundary has a specific definition. In case of thermodynamics, we have a specific definition of boundary. First of all, it has to be either real or imaginary surface that separates the system and, and from its surrounding. So boundary should be a clearly defined 
region or clearly defined uh, defined uh, thing which is separating the system and the surrounding okay uh, the context surface shared by both the system and the surrounding bounding is boundary is something which is sharing its surface with the surrounding as well as with the system okay and important thing is that it has zero thickness and can can either contain any mass or occupy volume in space so boundary is basically an imaginary concept here we are we consider that we have a system and then the system has a specific boundary and that boundary has zero thickness because this is an imaginary boundary uh, that separates the system from the surrounding okay so boundary could be fixed it could be movable for example this is an example of a uh, of uh, this is an example of a piston cylinder device so in the piston cylinder device we have this this is our piston and this is our cylinder and inside the gas is our system this is our system for for analysis outside the system we have the we have the surrounding and we have a boundary of the system now if you see the boundary of the system here the walls of the cylinder these three walls of the cylinder they are fixed and we have a piston here which is movable so, so we have a movable boundary, we have fixed boundary. So boundary can be fixed, it could be movable, it could be real, it could be imaginary, but it has zero thickness. Okay, so it does not really contribute in anything. Uh, it just separate the system from its surrounding. Now boundary has, uh, these are the three characteristics of the boundary. I want you to memorize them, okay? The one written in the box. So you should know that what are the characteristics of a thermodynamic boundary. Anybody has any questions so far? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. Okay, now let's uh, talk about uh, different type of systems. We have, uh, right now here mentioned is the three different type of system, but in reality we have four types of systems. I'm going to explain you about that in a minute. Okay, so we, we have classified the systems in terms of uh, mass and energy transfer. Okay, so let's discuss about open system. Open system is a system where mass can transfer in and out of the system, but we do not put any limitation over energy. Okay, so open system is a system where we put limitation over, uh, where, 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 where we place a limitation that mass can go in and out. This, this, is, this is the main thing. For open system, mass can go in and out. We do not say anything about energy here in this case. Energy can go in and out. Maybe energy do not go in and out. It doesn't matter. But open system is a system where mass can go in and out. On the contrary, we have a closed system. Now, closed system is a system where we put limitation over mass. Now, mass cannot go in and out. Again, we are not putting any restriction over energy. Energy can go in and out. Maybe energy cannot go in and out. But if the mass cannot go in and out, then this is a closed system. Do you understand open system and closed system? Please respond. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Now we have isolated system. Isolated system is a system where we put limitation over both math and mass and energy. In case of isolated system, neither the mass can go in and out, nor energy can go in and out. Is it clear? So no mass or energy transfer is possible. So when we say isolated system, there is a difference between isolated and closed system. Uh, a closed system put restriction over mass and it does not put any restriction over energy. Energy can go in and out, maybe it do not go in and out, but we are not concerned with energy in closed system. In isolated system, we put restriction on both mass as well as energy. Neither the mass can go in and out, nor energy can go in and out. Do you understand isolated system? So, sir, in a closed system, yes. uh, energy can go through the surfaces. Uh, of the yes, boundaries. yes, yes, yes. We are like not that. discussing. We are, we are, we are not putting any limitation over energy. Okay? okay. Energy can go through the boundary. Whatever, it it might not go through the boundary. We are not concerned with it. We are just concerned with the mass. For the case of closed system. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, now we have another system. The name is not written here, but it's going to be there in, 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 the, in the future slides. Okay, you will see that. It's known as adiabatic system. 
adiabatic system a d i a b a t i c adiabatic system now adiabatic system in adiabatic system we put limitation over energy we don't talk about mass okay so we put limitation of energy on energy energy if energy cannot go in and out of the system that is adiabatic system irrespective mass can go in and out or not so adiabatic system is a system where we put limitation over energy so energy cannot go in and out this is adiabatic system okay so we have four systems that we have discussed here is there anything within these systems their classifications that you do not understand please ask uh, yes sir how do you restrict uh, you know the the flow of energy how do we restrict the flow of energy uh, in, in fact, fact in, 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 in fact ideally we cannot okay there will always be a small transfer of energy but there are certain conditions like for example you have thermos thermos is basically what you can put hot water or your tea or your coffee inside the thermos and it will keep hot we are restricting the flow of energy from inside to out right so energy cannot go from in to out okay so thermos when you put insulation so in, when you put insulation you are restricting the flow of energy from going in to out or out to in okay although it cannot be 100% but it is an example of adiabatic system okay so it won't be completely restricted it will not be completely restricted but still um, adiabatic itself is an idea is an idealized system okay so okay, but okay. but you get the idea right uh, yes okay. anybody else want to ask anything Okay, let's move ahead. The properties no. of the system. Yes, you want to ask anything? No, sir. Okay, properties of a system. Now we have. We are going to discuss multiple properties of the system. The thermodynamic properties are very important here. Obviously, you are going to be using those thermodynamic properties to to analyze thermodynamic systems. So we have different properties like, for example, pressure, temperature, volume, mass, viscosity, thermal conductivity, thermal expansion coefficient, energy, enthalpy, entropy. There are so many properties. Okay, we specify the property into two major classes. We have intensive property and extensive properties. Okay, so we have here. This is the intensive property. This is the extensive property. Now, what are intensive properties? Intensive properties are the one which are independent of the mass. Intensive. You see the word in. Just remember it from the word in. in intensive, independent of the mass. Okay. Extensive properties are the those which are dependent on the mass. Now, I will give you an example. Suppose you have a glass of water. Okay, and the glass of water is filled with water. Okay, so suppose you take the temperature of the water and let's say that the temperature comes out to be 24 degree. Now what you do is that you throw half of the water out. So now the glass is only half filled. If you again take the temperature, what do you think? Will the temperature change or would it remain the same? Remain the same. It remain the same. That means you're changing the mass of water, but it's not affecting the temperature. Similarly, if you have a pressure measuring device, and you sir, the that's not necessary, right? For every yeah, situation, if you change the mass, the temperature would could change. No, if you change the mass and every other thing remains the same, then the temperature will not change. I'm talking okay. as, a, as, a, as a general example. Okay? okay, you have a glass of water in your home. Throw half of the water away. Still, the temperature of the water remains the same. Okay. okay? Uh, similarly, if you take the pressure of the water, okay. Uh, whatever the pressure of the water, if you if you remove half of the water from the glass, still the pressure of the water would remain the same. Okay, uh, you have the density of water. Whether the density of a droplet of water or you have a tank full of water, both will have the same density. Okay, so it does not depend upon the size. It does not depend upon the mass. So these are the independent prop. These 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 are the properties which are independent of the mass. So they are called the intensive properties. Now let me give you another property, uh, volume. Suppose you have a glass which is filled with water, so it's going to occupy some more volume, right? Now 
the, the, you have that volume of the water. Now you throw half of the water away. So what do you think? Will the volume will reduce because you throw half of the mass out, or will not, or will it remain the same? I'm, I'm not talking about the volume. I'm not the talking about the volume change. of the glass. I'm talking about the volume of the water. It will change. change. So, so it will change means this is a property which varies with the mass. If you change the mass, the property is going to vary. Okay, so that is an expensive property. Let's say, let's say total energy, total energy of water. So, if you have a glass full of water. Whatever the total energy you have, if you if you throw half of the water away, then the total energy will become half, because total energy is it depends upon the energy of all the molecules within the water. You have to throw half of the molecules, half of the energy is gone. So the total energy is again now an extensive property because it changes with the uh, with the change in 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 the mass. Okay. Do you get the idea of the difference between intensive and extensive properties or not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Now understand one thing here. Okay. Uh, you see here, it's written specific. Now, when we write specific here, especially in thermodynamics, when we write specific here, we have we have a meaning here, and when we write specific, it means anything per unit mass. So anything per unit mass is specific. So for example, when you say volume, volume is an extensive property, right? Volume is an extensive property we just discussed. But if you make it per unit mass, it becomes an intensive property. Now it is an intensive property. So any extensive property, if you divide it by mass, it will become an intensive property. Do you understand this statement or not? Any extensive property, if you divide it by mass, it will become an intensive property. I need your response, yes or no. Yes, sir. But will you be showing yeah. us any examples? In yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you will have plenty yeah, of yes. examples. So don't worry about that. Right now, just stay with me, okay? Uh, sometimes the students have questions which are related to the things you're going to you're going going to learn later, okay? So. As we're going to progress in this course, step by step, you're going to learn things. Okay, so so just 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 be with me, and uh, when I'm teaching something, just let me know whether you understand this concept or not. Yeah, the examples you're going to see it later. Don't worry. Okay, so remember one thing: in this course, you will have so many properties. Enthalpy will be extensive property. Okay, but when we say specific enthalpy, it means per unit mass. So enthalpy is what's kilojoule, and specific enthalpy will be kilojoule per kg. Entropy, the specific entropy, entropy per unit mass. Uh, internal energy, specific internal energy is inter internal energy per unit mass. Volume, specific volume is volume per unit mass. So whenever you have a specific word added to something, that means per unit mass. Is this point clear or not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. There is only one property for which. Specific does not mean this thing. We're going to discuss about that. Okay. For all other properties, whenever the word is specific, you see it means per unit mass, mass basis. Okay. But there is one property for which it does not mean that. And we are going to discuss that next. Okay. Okay. So let's first discuss about density. Density is basically what? Mass per unit volume. I, I I I just don't want you to know uh, uh, I I don't want you to just know about the formula. Of course, you know the formula of density, mass per unit volume. But uh, I I want you to understand the physical meaning of density. What is the physical meaning of density? Physical meaning of density means uh, how heavy is something. Okay. So if you want to relate something in terms how heavy it is or how light it is, you talk about density. Larger density means heavier the object. Smaller density means lighter the object. Do you get the physical understanding of it or not? Yes, sir. Okay. So density is uh, mass per unit volume. This will be kg per meter cube. Okay, and it depends upon temperature and pressure. Uh, if you change the temperature and pressure, the density would definitely vary. 
now the property which i was asking you the property which i was telling you was a specific gravity now here in specific gravity specific specific does not means per unit mass this is only one property here which is like this specific gravity means it's it's also known as relative density it means the ratio of density of a substance to the density of water means specific gravity specifies if an object is heavier than water or lighter than water so the so the weight of the object uh, with respect to the weight of the water okay so if an object is heavier than water or lighter than water this is something which is defined by specific gravity so for specific gravity this is one property which does not mean gravity per unit mass okay don't 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 relate a specific gravity like this it does not mean gravity per unit mass it means a uh, ratio of density of anything to the density of water means it's going to compare between uh, the weight of the water with the weight of that object okay tell me one thing what would be the unit of a specific gravity sir there won't be any unit and why do you think like that cuz it's a ratio sir yeah perfect 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 it it will have no unit why because it's a ratio of two densities density of anything divided by density of water so it will be unitless okay so specific gravity is something which is a ratio of two things and is going to define if something is heavier than water or lighter than water so let's have an example here for example look here table 1 table 1.3 water has a specific gravity 1 makes sense okay because we're talking about water so density of water by density of water that will be one talk about blood blood has specific gravity 1.05 what do you think is it heavier than water or lighter than water heavier yeah. heavier so if you put blood in water then the blood is going going to go down sea water sea water has specific gravity 1.025 what do you think is it heavier than water lighter than water heavier than heavier and why and why do you think sea water is heavier because of salt as perfect perfect because of the salt in it okay okay we have uh, gasoline first of all what is gasoline the fuel we use perfect okay so so gasoline is the fuel we use it's normally petrol it's not gas okay and uh, uh its specific gravity is 0.7 so what do you think lighter than water heavier than water lighter than water lighter than water ethyl alcohol lighter mercury 13.6 very very heavy wood 0.3 to 0.9 slighter obviously gold 19.2 heavy bone normally at 1.7 to 2 ice 0.92 so ice is lighter than water why do you think is ice is lighter than water sir because uh, particles are tightly packed mm, i no sorry i didn't get the right answer anybody who can tell why ice is lighter than water so the molecules of water expand when frozen yes basically there is an anomalous behavior of water that uh, water expands so molecules gets far away not tightly packed far away from each other and so uh, the ice becomes ha have have more volume compared to the volume of the water so its density becomes less so specific gravity will be less air has a specific gravity 0.0013 of course so you so do you understand the the basic physical uh, do you have the physical understanding of the specific gravity now what does it mean yes sir okay 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 so here we have uh, we are done with the specific gravity next thing is a specific weight another property uh, what's the definition written definition written is weight of a unit volume of substance okay specific uh, weight has definition written weight of a unit volume of substance if i put it in terms of the formula so it means weight over volume am i right specific weight as per the definition it's written is weight of a unit volume of a substance so if i write 
in terms of the formula as written in the definition it should be weight over volume but uh, what what's written here is that what's written here is is that specific weight is rho into g now do you understand how this formula become this yes sir how can you explain sir mass over volume would be density and perfect perfect weight is perfect. G. perfect perfect so weight is basically mg and m over volume will be density so density into g is basically specific weight okay and it's given the symbol gamma everybody understand that or not yes sir okay good uh, what will be the unit of a specific weight sir i guess it depends on which substance kg uh, the unit i'm talking about unit it's weight over volume right what's the unit of weight kilogram no unit of mass is kilogram what's the unit of weight newton newton and what's the unit of volume mm. meter square meter cube again minus square yes. meter cube right so weight over volume would be newton per meter cube yes sir okay so basically this is this is the way units are written but you can also write the unit in the basic unit format okay so you can convert newton into kg meter per second square then you can put me volume as meter cube you can cancel the terms and it will be like this but anyways the in in the book most of the time when they write specific weight so specific weight has been given the name uh, given the unit newton per meter cube as by the definition it's weight of a unit volume is it clear yes sir okay okay specific volume specific volume is uh, is as is basically a reciprocal of density density is mass per unit volume specific volume is volume per unit mass okay so it's meter cube per kg on the mole basis it's also written here you can go through it yourself we don't need basically on the mole basis in this course there is some description about a specific volume you can go through this description yourself okay so now let's come uh, before before starting this uh, topic of state and equilibrium till here is there anything which is not clear to anybody you can ask even if there is anything which you feel that you do not understand don't be shy let me know i will repeat it again okay the point the problem is that this course is is designed in a way that one concept is is building uh, the concepts are building over one another okay so if you don't understand something now you you will for sure not understand the other things in future okay so if you don't understand something now it's better to ask again rather than not understanding anything in the course okay so don't worry if you don't understand anything uh, i will repeat again okay so let's uh, come over to the next topic state and equilibrium uh, state is basically what state means uh, if i if, if i speak in urdu maujooda halat state okay so uh, the current condition of anything is its state okay so a set of properties that describe the condition of a system at a certain time okay at 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 a specific time what is the temperature what is the pressure what is the density what is the volume what is the enthalpy what is the entropy what is the internal energy blah blah everything combine all the properties at that specific point that is the state of that that thing that that system okay so maujooda halat kisi bhi cheez ki maujooda halat is the state okay and uh, uh when we talk about equilibrium what does equilibrium means can anybody explain you 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 probably have heard the word equilibrium before yes yeah, so when the system is balanced balanced perfect 
So um, anything, when, when something is balanced, means it is stable. When something is unstable, that means it is not in equilibrium. When something is stable, that means it is in equilibrium, means it is not unstable, it is not changing its shape or whatever. Some, some, everything is in equilibrium means if it stays the way it is. If something changes from one state to another state, that means that thing is not in equilibrium. Okay, so equilibrium is a state of balance. It, it, it's a perfect answer. Okay, when we talk equilibrium in thermodynamics, so we have we have different types of equilibrium. Okay, the first type is the thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium is basically what if the temperature is same throughout the entire system. Suppose we have a system, and within the system, the temperature throughout the system is same. So it's not changing at all. So we say that this system is in thermal equilibrium. Okay, so thermally, temperature is not changing. The thermal equilibrium. Uh, then we have mechanical equilibrium. In the fluid systems, when we talk about mechanical, we mean pressure. So if the pressure in the system is not changing at any point of the system with time, we say that we that, that system is in mechanical equilibrium. Phase equilibrium. You know, uh, all, all the substances have three phases. We have solid, liquid, gases. So suppose if we have, uh, uh, if we have multi-phase things let's say the ice is there with water but the quantity of ice is not changing and the quantity of water is not changing neither the ice is converting into water nor the water is converting into ice that means we are in a phase equilibrium okay so the phases remains constant then let's say we have a chemical equilibrium what is chemical equilibrium chemical equilibrium means if the com chemical composition of a system does not change with time then we say that no chemical reaction is occurring inside. And so we say that that object is in chemical equilibrium. So we have four different kind of equilibriums that define different states uh, of, of the system. Okay, when, when we talk about uh, in terms of temperature, that's thermal equilibrium. In terms of pressure, it's mechanical equilibrium. In terms of different phases, we have phase equilibrium. In terms of chemical reaction occurrence, we talk about ch chemical equilibrium. And let's say that we have a system where all the equilibriums are achieved. We have a system where we have thermal equilibrium in it, which is in mechanical equilibrium, which is in phase equilibrium, also in chemical equilibrium. So we say that that object is in total equilibrium. The total equilibrium means all equilibriums combined are there in, within, within the system. Do you understand the concept of equilibrium here or not? Is there anything which is not clear? Please ask. Clear, sir. The total equilibrium is also an ideal situation, right? Uh, yes, yes, it's also an ideal situation. Okay, so let's come over to the next topic: processes and cycles. So basically, process is basically what uh, uh, when a system is in a specific state and it's changing its state from point one to point two. So state is changing from state one to state two. So we say that the system is undergoing through a process. Okay, so let's say I had a system, it has a specific temperature, pressure and all the properties. But now let's say that the temperature is changing from one to two. So we have we have we have a change in temperature. So so when we have a change in temperature, so we say that the state is changed from one to two. And this process of change of state is is basically a process. Okay, so किसी भी एक हालत से दूसरी हालत में जाना is a process, okay? And suppose you you have a system which goes through multiple processes until it returns back to the same state from where it is started, then it is known as a cycle, okay? We are going to study many many thermodynamic cycles later on from chapter number nine onwards, but anyways, uh, the 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 point of understanding here is that you should know what does cycle means. So cycle means let's say you you have something which goes through a specific process one to two, then two to three, then state from three to four, then four to five, then five to six, then it return back to state one. So now it is a cycle. Okay. So uh, multiple pro process occur from when when the state change any parameter of the state. Let's say temperature, pressure, or or, or more than one parameters of the state are changing. So from state one to two, we say a process is occurring. And if you have multiple processes occurring, 
until a time come that it return back to the same state from where it is started then we say this is a cycle do you understand the processes and cycles yes sir okay state postulate state postulate basically is what when we say is that uh, for a system there are many thermodynamic properties okay and uh, we have uh, different uh, tables we have different charts through which we can find all these properties if we know any of the two independent properties this is a state postulate state postulate says if you need to know at least two independent properties to find out all of the properties of the system if suppose two properties are not available if only one property is available that this is not enough you can not find all the other properties of the of that system okay this is a state postulate state postulate is something is a concept you are going to understand much better when we are going to come to chapter number 3 right now even if you don't understand this no problem okay but the main concept is that of state postulate for any system if you want to find all the properties you need to know at least two independent properties one is not enough this is a state postulate the one written in the red the state of a simple compressible system is completely specified by two independent intensive properties this is the complete statement of the state postulate and the one written in the red i want you to memorize okay the one written in the red i want you to memorize if i ask you what is a state postulate you should know what is a state postulate okay. whenever i ask you to memorize any definition or anything okay just understand one thing uh, it's not necessary to repeat exactly the same words but the meaning should be the same okay so if you think your english is not good then it's better to memorize those words but if your english is good enough then you can use on your own wording and if the concept is the same it's okay So that's uh, state postulate. Is this true for every system, or this? Yes, yes, this is true for every system. Thermodynamic cycle. We just discussed that. Okay, now we have another concept here: quasi-equilibrium or quasi-static process. Okay, uh, the, this thing could be more easily understood by. By the by, by the concept or the or the example of uh, of of a clock, you see in a clock we have three needles. We have hour needle, we have minute needle, and we have second needle. Now, if you look at the second needle, you will find that the second needle is in motion. You can see the motion yourself if you look at the second needle. It's very fast. You can see it. But if you look at the minute needle. so for a moment for a moment it looks like that it is not moving but if you keep on looking at it for some time you will realize that even the minute needle is moving motion is very slow but it is moving if you look at the hour needle so the hour needle looks like that it is not moving at all but in reality it is in motion right so when we say quasi equilibrium so quasi equilibrium means fake equilibrium false equilibrium something that looks like it is in equilibrium but in reality it is not in equilibrium the hour needle it look like it is stationary but in reality it is not stationary the hour needle looks like it is in equilibrium but in reality it is still in motion and not in equilibrium do you understand the concept here or not yes yes sir, yes, sir. Okay. so when we say quasi equilibrium or quasi static equilibrium uh, or quasi static process we means that a process which looks like that it is stable it looks like that it is in equilibrium but in reality it is not in equilibrium okay now what is the advantage of this thing the thing is that when we assume anything in equilibrium our solution our process becomes easy our the solution of the problem becomes easy when we when we assume that it is an equilibrium okay so the so the idea of quasi equilibrium is that we know that it is not in equilibrium but we will still solve it as if it is in equilibrium now the question is that if something is not in equilibrium and we solve it by assuming that it is in equilibrium will there be error in our answer yes there will be 
but the error is so small that we can we can live with that we can accept that error so this is this this is the reason why we define this quasi equilibrium thing because in solution in solving a lot of problems if we assume that the, that our system is not in equilibrium then our problem becomes too much complicated okay so in order to simplify it we make an assumption that it is in equilibrium although we ourselves know that it is not in equilibrium that's why we call it quasi static equilibrium or quasi equilibrium okay so it's a fake equilibrium it's a false equilibrium it's an equi it looks like it is in equilibrium but in reality it is not in equilibrium but the effect of non equilibrium is very little so we can assume it to be in equilibrium do you understand it or not yes sir. yes sir okay so here the first sentence is important when the process proceeds in such a manner that the system remains infinitesimally close to cis equilibrium state at all time it is not in equilibrium but it remains very close to equilibrium the our needle is not stationary but its motion is so slow that it looks like that it is stationary it's very close to equilibrium so when a process proceeds in such a manner that the system remains infinitesimally close to equilibrium state at all times this is known as quasi equilibrium if i ask you the definition of quasi equilibrium this is the definition okay please memorize it or uh, oh, pardon sorry any example of quasi equilibrium you will have examples of it okay don't worry about it we, when we when we move towards the next chapters then you're going to see okay sir okay. <clears throat> let's come over to the next topic temperature is a measure of hotness and coldness we have a specific zero law of thermodynamics uh the statement of zero law of thermodynamics is that if two bodies are in thermal equilibrium with a third body they are also in thermal equilibrium with each other it's you know basically mathematics associative property if a is in thermal equilibrium with c and c is in thermal equilibrium with b that means a is in thermal equilibrium with b or in mathematics associative property we say a equals to c c equals to b that means a equals to b okay this is a very fundamental property uh this is a fundamental law and uh, in what we are studying is classical thermodynamics and classical thermodynamics in reality it is not that much it, it is not of that significance those who study statistical thermodynamics uh, for them uh, zero law of thermodynamics has more importance but for us it has less importance comparatively okay but anyways i want you to memorize the statement of zero law of thermodynamics the one written in the box if two bodies are in thermal equilibrium with a third body they are also in thermal equilibrium with each other okay so kindly you should know what is zero law of thermodynamics you see adiabatic process the word adiabatic is written here uh, i told you about adiabatic system okay in in the previous slides anyways do you understand zero law of thermodynamics Yes sir. Yes sir. Okay, when we talk about temperature, we have uh, different conversions between temperature. So we have Celsius as we have Celsius scale could be converted into Kelvin scale. Uh correspondingly we have Fahrenheit scale it could be converted into Rankine. Okay. So the, the all the conversions into conversions are shown here. So you can just go through these conversions. normally we will be dealing in the si unit so fahrenheit scale is not important here for us but the celsius scale scale is important okay pressure pressure is another thermophysical uh, thermodynamic property which is important pressure is force over area okay now pressure has units newton per meter square however there are certain other units which are important as well now i'm going to uh, mark uh, or highlight a region kindly memorize this pressure conversion these two lines 1 bar equals to 10 to the power 5 pascal which is equals to 0.1 megapascal which is equals to 100 kilopascal and one atmosphere is 101 
three to five Pascal, which is equals to one zero one point three to five kilopascal, which is equals to one point zero one three to five bars. Okay, this is pressure unit conversion. Okay, but the thing is that uh, this will be used so frequently that if you mess up here, your numericals are going to be messed up definitely. Okay, so uh, there was actually no no specific need for it, but I I still want you to memorize these units. Okay. When we go through the thermodynamic tables, you're going to realize that uh, we have sometimes units mentioned, units of pressure mentioned in Pascal. Sometimes they are mentioned in megapascal. Sometimes they are mentioned in kilopascal. Sometimes they are mentioned in bars. So uh, I, I want you to have this unit conversion on your fingertips, okay? So that things will not become complicated for you when you go through the tables. Is this thing clear or not? Yes, sir, it's clear. Okay, these two lines, please, please, I'll, I'll request you memorize these two lines, okay? Just these two. The bottom one, not important for us. KGF per centimeter square, uh, Newton per centimeter square, Newton per, okay, this, this conversion is not important. The, the important conversion I have already highlighted to you, okay? Two lines. There is a specific paragraph related to this pressure. You can go through it yourself. Okay. So far, everything is clear or not? Is there anything anybody want to ask? My, it, it's important that I need to know that are you catching up with me or not, okay? If, if there's anything that, that needs to be changed in my delivery of lecture, then let me know. Yes, you understand. Okay. My language is clear. No barrier here, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so we're going to start the next topic here, but just uh, have a break of five minutes and then we're going to start the next topic.
Okay, let's uh, start back. Uh, can you hear me, students? <coughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let's discuss about uh, pressure. Uh, let me give you a concept of pressure here. Uh, how is the pressure exerted by fluid? Okay, so basically we have fluid and in fluid we have molecules which are randomly moving together, okay? So they collide with each other and these molecules also collide with the walls of the container. Suppose we have a fluid inside a container so the molecules are going to collide with each other as well as they're going to collide with the walls of the container, okay? And when the molecules collide with the walls of the container, they exert the pressure. So the pressure is observed by the molecules colliding with the walls of the container, okay? Now the thing is that if we have large number of molecules, then the pressure will be large. If we have small number of molecules, then the pressure will be small. Okay, so if let's say if we want to, to reduce the pressure, what we can do is that we can start removing the molecules of the fluid inside the container and the molecules will be kept on removing uh, until a time will come that uh, all the molecules will be removed. And now let's say when all the molecules are removed, so there is no molecule to collide with the walls of the container and so there is actually zero pressure. With this concept of pressure explained to you, tell me one thing, is it possible to have a negative pressure? Either uh, say sir, yes. Yes, sir, repeat, uh, there was an internet problem from my side. Okay, let me repeat again. Okay, let me give you a concept of a pressure here. Okay, the concept of pressure is that uh, we have, let's say we have a fluid. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, we, we, have, we have a fluid. Okay, and uh, the fluid is composed of molecules of the fluid, which are, which are moving randomly, striking each other, colliding with each other, and also with the walls of the container. Okay, so uh, suppose that, uh, uh, so, so when the molecules of the fluid strike the, the walls of the container, so they exert the pressure on it, okay? And so how, this is how the pressure is observed on the walls of the container, okay? If we want to increase the pressure, we have more molecules. We need to add more molecules there, okay? But suppose if you want to reduce the pressure, then the methodology would be to remove the molecules from, of fluid from the container. Less molecules, less pressure. Suppose you keep on removing molecules until the time comes that you have removed each and every molecule of fluid from the container. So now there's absolutely no molecule available inside the container. So now this is absolutely zero pressure. Now, my question is that, do you think with this explanation of pressure, is it possible, is it possible to have a negative pressure? No, sir. No, sir. No, that's not possible. True. The minimum in this way, the minimum possible is what? Minimum possible is, abs is, is zero pressure where you have no molecules at all. Okay. But negative pressure is not possible in this way. This definition of pressure, which I have explained you right now, this definition of pressure is known as absolute pressure. You know, the absolute word is, a, is, is a basically used in mathematics a lot. Anything with an absolute can never become negative. Anything with an absolute can never become negative. So when we, when we define pressure in this way, the way I defined you right now, this way, the definition of pressure in this way means this, the pressure can never go negative. So that's why this definition of pressure is known as absolute pressure. We're gonna go, we're gonna go step by step. First of all, I want you to let me know. Do you understand what is absolute pressure? Yes, sir. Okay, now let's move ahead. Uh, suppose uh, you want to measure the pressure. Suppose you want to measure the pressure, okay, of something. Let's say you have tire inside the tire, you have air, you want to measure the pressure of air in the tire. Okay, sorry, uh, yeah, air in the tire. Okay, so what you're gonna go do, what you're gonna do is that you're gonna go into the market 
and you're going to ask that okay i need a, a device which can measure the pressure okay so the device which measures the pressure that device is known as pressure gauge okay so what what they're going to give you is pressure gauge now pressure gauge is a device which measures the pressure but it cannot measure absolute pressure the thing that it can measure is the gauge pressure now what is the difference between absolute and gauge pressure this is now important point of discussion okay so let me zoom in so that you can see this picture here this is important okay okay so what i'm saying is that uh, suppose you have you want to measure the pressure of air in the tire you go to market you you buy an instrument that can measure the pressure okay so the the instrument which will measure the pressure is known as pressure gauge and the pressure gauge is not going to give you absolute pressure it's going to give you gauge pressure now the question is what is gauge pressure so gauge pressure is basically the pressure relative to atmospheric pressure how much a pressure is higher than atmospheric pressure this is gauge pressure this is point you need to understand okay so let's see let's let's say here okay since let's say this is uh, this is absolute vacuum here okay let's say this is uh, this is absolute vacuum okay and uh, let's say this is uh, atmosphere pressure okay and uh, let let me put a number for it let's say atmospheric pressure is 100 okay now you go to the market and uh, you want to measure the pressure of air in the tire let's say you do, you, you you measure a, you you purchase a pressure gauge and the pressure gauge when you connect with with the tire it gives you the reading 20 okay it gives you the reading 20 so the pressure gauge gave you the reading 20 and you know the atmospheric pressure is 100 so what will be the absolute pressure the absolute pressure will be 120 now you need to understand the relationship here look there is no device which can measure absolute pressure you have a device which can measure atmospheric pressure and you have a device which can measure gauge pressure and gauge pressure is always relative to atmospheric pressure how much something's pressure greater than atmosphere is going to be measured by the gauge pressure device okay so if you want to know that what is the absolute pressure so you need to add up absolute pressure, uh, atmospheric pressure reading with the gauge reading and that's going to give you the absolute pressure so for example in an atmosphere of 100 units if the gauge uh, if if the gauge reading is 20 that means the abs that means the absolute reading is 120 if the atmospheric reading is 100 gauge reading is 20 then the absolute reading is 120 first of all tell me do you understand this concept or not yes sir okay so i i am giving you a relationship between absolute pressure gauge pressure and atmospheric pressure the pressure gauges will always give you the reading relative to atmospheric pressure suppose if the atmospheric pressure was 90 and the gauge is giving you 20 so what will be the absolute pressure 110 110 perfect let's go other way around suppose if the absolute pressure is 110 and the gauge is giving you the reading 30 so what would be the atmospheric pressure 80 80 perfect the point is that you need to understand this relationship okay you will not find a device which is going to give you absolute pressure reading absolute you need to calculate but you can find a device which will measure the atmospheric pressure and you can find a device which will give, which will give you the gauge reading now then you have to use the gauge reading and atmospheric reading to give to get the absolute reading to get the absolute value do you understand this concept this relationship or not yes sir okay so p atmosphere plus p gauge is equals to p absolute absolute 
Okay, so this thing is clear now. Anybody has any problem here? Because may, I'm going to move to the next step once I know that it's okay to everybody. Sir, in usual, the atmospheric pressure is higher than the gauge pressure. Uh, atmospheric pressure is not higher than the gauge pressure. Atmos normally, when we say gauge pressure, we means a pressure how much higher than the atmosphere. If the gauge is zero, means it's actually atmosphere. So that's that's not true. Atmospheric pressure is not higher than the gauge pressure. Okay. So gauge reading is will it will always be the reading which is going to tell you how much pressure is higher from atmosphere. So gauge reading will be give you a reading that is going to tell you how much a pressure is higher than the atmosphere. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So now let's move on to the next thing. Now suppose if you want to measure a pressure which is lower than atmosphere, then you will you will go to the market and you will get another device, and this device is known as vacuum gauge. Now vacuum gauge is a device which is going to give you the pressure reading how much pressure lower than atmosphere. This is again relative to atmosphere. Like gauge was relative to atmosphere, but gauge was giving you the reading how much higher than atmosphere. The vacuum gauge is going to give you the reading how much lower than atmosphere. Okay, so suppose if the atmospheric pressure is 100, okay, and your vacuum pressure, uh, vacuum gauge reading is give you a reading of 30. So what will be the absolute pressure? Seventy. So can you repeat, please? Seven, seventy. Once again, okay. Suppose uh, the atmospheric pressure was hundred, and the device which used to measure vacuum pressure gave you the reading thirty. Okay. So now, what is the absolute pressure? So remember, the device which measures the vacuum pressure, it only measures how much lower than atmosphere the pressure is. Again, the relative to atmosphere. Okay. So like for the case of gauge, it was measuring how much higher than atmosphere, the vacuum gauge is going to measure how much lower than atmosphere pressure. Is it clear? So suppose if the atmospheric pressure is 100, and let's say that the vacuum gauge is giving the reading 30, so what will be the absolute pressure? 70. 70. Do you understand this relationship or not? Yes, sir. I so, va va so, va so the vacuum pressure, vacuum gauge reading is like negative of the pressure gauge reading. Vacuum gauge reading is like the negative of the pressure gauge reading. Pressure gauge reading was giving you the reading how much higher than atmosphere. Vacuum gauge reading will give you the reading how much lower than atmosphere. Okay. Now, tell me one thing. Suppose if the atmospheric pressure was ninety, and uh, the vacuum gauge is giving you the reading ten. So what will be the absolute pressure? 80. 80, perfect. Suppose if, uh, if you know that the absolute pressure is 100, suppose if you know that the absolute pressure is 100, and uh, the gauge value uh, and the vacuum gauge is giving you the reading 10, so what would be the atmospheric pressure? 110. 110, perfect. The point was to make you understand this relationship. Okay, so here the relationship is what p atmosphere plus p gauge is equals to p absolute. Here the relationship is what p atmosphere minus p vacuum is equals to p absolute. Do you understand these relationships here or not? Yes, sir. Understood. Okay. Now try to understand why why we are looking at things like this because. We want to know absolute pressure, but there is no device which is going to give you absolute pressure. We have a device which can measure atmospheric pressure. And then we have devices which can measure if the pressure is higher than atmosphere, gauge pressure, if the measure is lower than atmosphere, vacuum, vacuum pressure. We have those devices, but we have no device which can give you directly absolute pressure. So you need to find absolute pressure by using the pressure and the gauge, by using the atmosphere and the gauge reading, or by using the atmosphere and the vacuum reading. And then the relationship would be this, the one which I have just 
explain it to you. So these are the relationships. If you look at these diagrams, the relationship becomes more and more clear to you. Is there anything within this relationship which is not clear? Please ask. No, sir. No, sir. Sir, actually, I was saying that because my internet is a little bit of a problem. So, in case I get disconnected, then I will put my attendance. Just a minute. Tell me one thing. अटेंडेंस कहाँ कहाँ लगती है? I mean मैंने अपने पास तो लिख लिया है कि ये सब आप लोग सब प्रेजेंट हो but I'm not sure because because I'm teaching here for the first time in Zebra so I don't know कि अटेंडेंस लगती किधर है। Zebra desk में आपका होता है ऑप्शन होता है अटेंडेंस लगाने का। अच्छा तो आप ये तो ये तो आप नोट कर लें सारी और फिर एंड में सेमेस्टर के एंड में लगा लें so anyways, I have a note that everybody is available except I don't know, Anil Ahmed is not available. Anil Ahmed is my program manager. Oh, okay. So they are added as a student? No, no. Probably a mistake. Okay. Because I saw him as a student. Anyways. So, but everybody was present today. Except A105. Okay. Anyways. So, uh, that's it for today. I think it's about uh, two o'clock here. So that means in Pakistan, it is four o'clock. So uh, that's it uh, for today. And inshallah, we are going to continue from here onward next week. Okay. Okay, if sir. You have, Thank you. If, if you have any questions, you can ask. Okay. And uh, otherwise, if you. Sir, you want, it, please upload for the class. Once again, once again, catches. सर इस स्लाइड्स जो आपने पढ़ाई है ना ये प्लीज अपलोड कर दीजिएगा मैंने अपलोड अपलोड कर दी है आई ये जो आपने अभी पढ़ाया है इसपे सारी लिखी हुई है ना चीजें ओह ओके एक्चुअली पता है क्या ये जो है ना वीडियो रिकॉर्डिंग हो रही है ओके सो जो जो वीडियो है दैट विल बी प्रोवाइडेड टू य� Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So video, you can see that would be better. Okay, sir. Obviously, you will put it in the classroom. Yes, in the classroom. In the classroom, it will automatically generate. I'm not sure right now. Sir, I think you have to upload it. Yes, sir. You will have an email. This email will come. You will have a link generated. Then you will have to upload it. Okay, sir. Okay. I will do it. Inshallah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, sir. Thank you, Lafiz. Okay, okay. Right now, okay, okay. I just, just one minute. I need your feedback, in the sense, are you able to keep up with me? Are you able to catch up me? Catch up with me in in the course? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. आपको समझ आ रही है कौन सा सवाल? Yes, sir. So far, we are. So far, we are. चलो डेट्स ग्रेट डेट्स ग्रेट इफ यू वांट एनी चेंजेस इन माय टीचिंग मेथोडोलॉजी स्टाइल जस्ट लेट मी नो ओके नो नो सर ओके डेट्स डेट्स ग्रेट ओके थैंक यू हेलो सर मेरी आवाज आ रही है